नमस्कार सागर जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू फॉर मेकिंग द टाइम Oh no, it's an honor. It's an honor. Uh, so, Sagar, let's start with uh, how you came to be uh, at all interested in the violence, non-violence dynamic. I mean, what's your earliest memory, perhaps, of the very possibility or the concept of non-violence? Well, I guess uh, at a very young age, I did see. Uh, the difference between genders both at home and outside not that there was violence at home but there was a hierarchy and uh, that really triggered my uh, i think intuitive uh, because i grew up in bombay uh, and i grew up in a very secular uh, home as well as a secular school and a secular kind of a neighborhood so it, it triggered my uh, let's say um, uh, belief that yes uh, things must be equal uh but i've come a long way from there and uh, moved on in many ways and uh, and so here i am trying to explain violence and non violence in terms of um, energy use so from bombay iit you could have gone down many conventional tracks how did you uh, become an alternative thinker in the field of energy and and was your awareness about uh the importance of uh, overcoming structural violence was that a factor in this well uh actually what uh, my engineering um education made me do even while i was in engineering college it made me wonder uh home all that science and technology was for and uh, uh somehow i came to the conclusion that it was certainly not for the common person or definitely not for the poor in india so i searched and that search took me first to gandhi then to schumacher and subsequently other thinkers and um i mean while most of my classmates were packing their bags after we graduated uh, they were going off to the us or you know um, packing their bags and taking good jobs i uh, decided to go and uh, stay for some time uh, in thane district in uh, in a small hamlet not even a village which is 16 kilometers from the closest bus stop mm-hmm. uh, this is where uh, uh, the bombay sena had just retrieved a lot of land for the adivasi that taught me a lot of lessons uh, it taught me um, a lot of things about uh, inequality about you know the fight for equality and things of that sort and it taught me that you know the technology that i had really learned was no good for the adivasi after spending about 3 months uh, with uh, bhumi sena in a remote village where uh, i even learned to cook on a firewood uh, chula um i came back took a job but uh, yes started getting involved with, with uh, trade unions and with you know issues which concern uh, poor people uh my search for technology took me further you know the kind right kind of technology because that was the time that uh, the the uh, club of rome report was written and for the first time you know uh, we started uh, thinking about well are the resources in the world unlimited why have we used so much of uh, these resources and um, rachel carson's book silent spring was also published and so you know these kind of uh, really motivated many of us to start searching along different lines um my uh, arrival at uh, trying to use energy as a tool to understand human history happened much later um after i worked uh, for several years as uh, for several decades in fact as an environmental engineer having shifted fields from mechanical to environmental engineering and um, i really uh, uh, you know um, at some point some trade union came and asked me to do a coal policy for india an alternate coal policy and uh, basically that then i asked them the question i said why not an alternate energy policy which took into consideration you know the uh, uh, viewpoint of workers and and so on what year would no this answer. be what year was this this was around, this was around 2003 2004 
and i started looking at energy very very seriously and i suddenly discovered that uh, actually the uh, history of nature and history of human society is the play of energy and uh, the way that i learned history was all wrong and you know i suddenly discovered that the way i was taught history was like a railway timetable uh, it's you know like a train came and a train went and it uh, it was late by you know half an hour or something some king came and king went he did some good he did some bad he married a beautiful princess blah 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 you know uh, to use the latest uh, term from glasgow blah 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 you know so so i started exploring the whole subject of energetics and started weaning myself out of uh, air pollution control and risk analysis which were the two fields i had specialized in i started looking at energetics and uh, how, what energy does to nature and what it does to human beings and i started teaching this subject in fact uh, uh, of energetics and in the whole history uh, of human society uh, is a uh, uh, double thieving we have first uh, stolen a lot of energy from the rest of the species and what we stole we didn't distribute it equally we distributed it uh, unequally within society itself so there are two ideologies that really uh, have allowed us to do this one is what we call anthropocentrism and i in fact dare say that a lot of people who talk about uh, violence uh, are very anthropocentric in their viewpoint because they look at violence only within human society and not what not the kind of violence that human society has done to nature uh, and the other really is um, what i call private ownership of uh, nature and nature's products uh, so there is this double thieving that uh, we have done and all that is part of uh, our uh, dna today we have we have used violence to do this kind of thieving and so uh you know uh, if you want me to continue i will do that unless you want to ask a question well i just wanted here to maybe uh ask you a subsidiary uh, question that this phenomenon of the in- unequal distribution of energy and also the modes of energy is it an ancient problem or has it really uh been uh, an ancient problem that has been accelerated by modern times or is there a continuum and that we have been creating uh-huh. this problem uh from time immemorial what what is your view on that yeah uh it is an ancient problem and it has certainly got accelerated in the last uh, 300 years ever since we started uh, using fossil fuels because uh, if you uh, put on the slide which says differences between humans and other species only humans create knowledge of energy conversion it's only humans who have the capability to develop knowledge in particular knowledge of energy conversion um and this uh, is what in fact is at the bottom of the problem if you click on the r glass you'll get the full picture um so what has happened basically is that uh, we have continuously taken more and more energy from nature as long as uh, you know we were hunter gatherers more than 10000 years back we took very little energy and it was basically for survival reproduction and evolution the reproduction and evolution part is very small it's less than 2% of the total energy but it was basically for survival now you did not have a uh, private ownership of nature everything was uh, you know sort of shared and so that part of the violence wasn't there but the minute we learned to domesticate plants and animals about 10000 years ago um we changed the whole face of uh, or we started changing the environment because uh, we clear felled a lot of land and uh, for that we used a lot of energy and converted it into farm land and that when we did a back calculation on how much energy was used we clear felled one third of the total forest area that was available 10000 years ago if you look at that slide it's a very uh, it's the next slide uh, we clear felled 20 million square kilometers of farm land and in the last 8000 years and each year 
we have expended the amount of energy that is there in 20,000 Hiroshima sized bombs, multiply that by 8,000. That is the amount of violence we've done against nature. So, uh, you know, basically when you clear fell a forest, it's not just the tree that you're cutting, you are getting rid of all the species in that, or most of the species uh, in that forest as well. Now, when you compare what we the violence that we perpetuated against nature, which is uh, not what most people talk about, those who talk about uh, violence, uh, the genesis of our violence is there. That we have used it against nature, and that's that is uh, what we have done. The obviously the next two steps are you know logical uh, sequels to the violence against nature that we perpetuated, which is. We have, uh, since slavery, created a institution called private property. And uh, I've looked up a lot of literature in uh, law and in uh, philosophy to see what is the basis of private property, and I have not found it. Um, I will explain it very simply. Uh, if I invest one joule of energy uh, in getting coal, I can get 20 to 30 joules back. So the 19 joules or 29 joules is really profit. By investing that one joule, I claim uh, property rights over the remain or, or, or out of the 20 joules. But really, the question to ask here is who, how much energy was expended, and who expended the energy to make that one joule of coal? And the answer is really nature. So what is the uh, sanctity in human beings saying that I own this coal. All that uh, energy of one joule that we have expended is only to explore, to uh, extract, and to transport, and maybe a little bit of refining that is done. That's all we've done. We've not made it. So when I tried doing uh, some kind of a computation on how much energy nature used to make one joule of coal, it runs into the, there is almost no literature on this. So I used a little bit of uh, chemistry, uh, you know, to try and do this uh, and came to a very inexact figure of it. it is in the thousands of joules to make one joule that uh, Mother Earth has used. So we have no right to call that coal ours. And by calling it ours, what happens is if out of the 19 joules, which is profit, instead of the next time around, I, ex I, I invest two joules then you know, it, uh, I get uh, 40 joules, 38 of which is profit. And that then makes me create more violence, uh, not just against uh, nature, but also against human society. Because what happens then is that if the Adivasis and the forest are in the way to, you know, for me to get that coal, then I have to get rid of both. And this is exactly the process that is happening in India today or has been happening in Brazil or happening in Australia or elsewhere uh, with, you know, which have large coal deposits or oil deposits. This is uh, at the bottom of the whole thing. Now, yeah. No, so, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so basically we uh, have increased our energy uh, extraction from mother nature and therefore we have increased our violence also against nature. And it has grown exponentially, particularly in the last 300 years. Um, and to get that uh, mineral, whether it be coal or any other mineral, obviously anybody who stands in the way, we have to sort of uh, uh, use violence against. So somewhere down the line, um, it's gone very deep into our DNA. Now, do you ask, if you ask a question, well, uh, other species also, you know, use force or energy uh, against uh, their prey. True, but they use it only for survival. We use it not just for survival, we use it for much more than survival. So, as Gandhi said, it's not just, uh, you know, our needs, but it's our wants that we fulfill. And it's the wants of a few. And therefore, violence is uh, very much structural in our society. Uh, Sagar, can I just pause you here? Because that's an interesting point about animals using energy to catch their prey, but they use their own body energy. That's I, right. I, 
I cannot, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I cannot think of any animal that extracts any form of energy from outside its body to capture its food. I mean, birds may use twigs, etc. to make their homes. You're absolutely right that uh, other creatures use their claws and fangs uh, to extract energy. Uh, humans use their brain to extract energy. And it's there in that previous slide. So we have moved on you know, from using biomass and uh, what I call animate energy, which is both human and uh, you know, uh, animal energy, uh, animal energy of those animals that we have domesticated to about a thousand years back, learning how to use wind and water and 300 years back, learning how to use fossil fuels. And uh, growth really has happened uh, at an exponential rate after fossil fuels were tapped. Uh, so we've created technologies that really can use fossil fuels and we are nearly at the end of uh, the fossil fuel era. What next? But I won't go into that question right now. I will remain with uh, the question of uh, violence. Now, my take uh, is twofold on this whole question. Uh, animals will not and cannot eschew uh, the kind of energy that they use against their prey. Can humans do it is the question. Now, by nature, humans are not uh, vegetarian or vegan. Uh, they are omnivorous. So the point is that if hum since humans basically use their brain uh, in not just uh, to create knowledge, but also, in fact, to create ethics and morality, it's really up to humans uh, to decide uh, whether they want to move on from being a violent kind of a species uh, to a relatively non-violent species. And I will bring in an uh, interesting issue out here uh, to which we really don't have very uh, good answers, but uh, let me pose the question. Now, there is something called the second law of thermodynamics, which basically talks about uh, disorder increasing with time. Now, life, all forms of life is actually ordering molecules. So you could well ask the question that actually on Earth, order has increased and humans are the highest form of that order as far as we know. So have we gone against the second law of thermodynamics? The answer is no, we haven't because the energy that we've got uh, from the sun, which is basically solar energy, which is what in fact, uh, uh, you know, helps photosynthesis happen. And it's only because of photosynthesis that all other life forms in fact uh, exist. Uh, in the uh, creation of uh, solar energy, there is disorder. You cannot put those molecules back very easily together, uh, the fusion reaction that is happening in the sun. So while uh, you can have order happening in one small part of a system, if you look at the system as a whole, disorder is growing. But the point is this, that with human beings, uh, you know, basically using fossil fuels and creating disorder, you know, by expanding entropy, the question arises, are human beings a uh, nature's answer, in fact, to the uh, so-called uh, dilemma of the second law of entropy, whereas all other creatures have created entropy, uh, negative entropy, or some people don't like to use the word negative entropy, uh, create order, uh, are humans really a, a natural selection by which actually we go back to creating disorder? So I really don't have an answer and I don't know if anybody really has an answer. But uh, if you look at the last slide, uh, one thing we do know for sure that as energy, as power density increases, complexity of molecules increases and we have the highest complexity so if you look at the power density out there, uh, human society has uh, the highest power density as compared to galaxies or stars or planets or other animals. <laughs> and uh, do human, the question still uh, uh, exists, do humans have a self-destruct button somewhere in their brain? Uh, I really don't have an answer. I don't know who has an answer to this whole thing. People have mused about it. Uh, thought about it and provided various kinds of answers. I will leave it at that. As a scientist, I will leave it at that. 
all i will say if you go back uh, if you go forward one slide is that uh, we have created institutions the modern institution is the university or the school and these institutions basically are institutions which encourage the growth of entropy now do we now consciously start thinking about creating knowledge which creates you know which goes the uh, in the reverse direction that is goes towards negative entropy okay and do we eschew knowledge which actually creates more entropy well it's out there the questions are out there it's for us to decide which way to go i think if we go if we want to go towards uh, ahimsa it has to be unlike with other species a conscious choice that we have to make and i think we have to make that choice uh, if we want to become a equal uh, uh, sustainable and a peaceful society and i dare say this that many who argue for uh, equality or uh, sustainability much, much less sustainability but equality uh, they themselves i have noticed used often times violent methods uh, if for you for example for example the very uh, organizations that talk about equality whether it be class equality or gender equality or even race equality often resort to violent methods if uh, the means that you use to uh, go towards an end that you want is different then you are sending a contradictory message and your message will not go through mm. and uh, therefore i am a complete votary of using absolutely non violent peaceful method for uh, transiting society towards equality towards sustainability and peace so sagar on the human to human violence Uh, a lot has happened a lot of innovations have happened in the last 70 years and and uh, as this series is trying to demonstrate ahimsa conversations that the story of non violence after gandhi is very rich but in your sphere where you are raising the issue of how human beings uh pull back from or transform their uh, pull back from their violence against nature and transform our equation with the rest of the natural world is really non violence a major enough issue yet uh because a lot of the dominant discourse on sustainability uh, from what i've been able to tell is still having a very managerial approach it's not uh, my impression is that it doesn't ask this fundamental or doesn't draw attention to this fundamental question what is your because you because you're inside the ring so what is your uh, view on how much is the violence non violence issue central to the discourse now both in the alternative circles and in the corridors of official power well in the corridors of official power um, there is implicit violence because in the formation of any form of state even at a very small kind of a uh, village level or something uh, there is an element of uh, force energy use coercion or a concentration of energy which is what the state is that it it commands us i'm not getting into the whole political debate of it but my take is that actually the state is an embodiment of a massive amount of uh, energy that's what it is basically and as long as you have this kind of a concentration of energy in the hands of a few uh, whether it be a socialist state or a capitalist state you will have violence yeah. out there now uh, is it that can we have a, a, a state which actually does away completely with energy no you can't because you are going to have people who uh, by whatever genetic predisposition they could be violent and therefore you need to control uh, certain elements fair enough so i am not going to go into that but i would say this that if i talk about civil society 99% of the discussion on violence that i have heard is really about violence uh, between one set of humans against another and it is not one uh, nature versus humans 
essentially because I'll, uh, we are completely dominated by an anthropocentric way of uh, thinking. And those who talk about nonviolence are also quite anthropocentric. For example, I've had conversations with trade unionists, I've had conversations with feminists and so on. And the question of sustainability doesn't come into the picture because the question of sustainability basically makes you ask a very fundamental question. How much energy can we take from nature and call ourselves sustainable? And there is no answer to this. But discussing the question of sustainability, uh, the energy issues don't come in. And therefore, the violence uh, aspect of it doesn't come in. But even if I talk about sustainability, someone is going to say X, someone else is going to say Y, and so on and so forth. There is no agreement today uh, on this question. But the question itself is very fundamental. How much can we take from nature? Particularly, how much energy can we take? I do have some tentative answers, but uh, those are fairly complex, so I'm not going to get into them right now. Yeah. So uh, the effort, the campaign to have ecocide uh, declared a crime, uh, you know, there's a campaign. We recently had the leader of that campaign, Jojo Mehta, on the, as, as a part of this series. So they are saying that, of course, all life subsists on life. And nonviolence is not ever an absolute, because if we were to define it in absolute terms, it would become meaningless. Absolutely. And they are saying that there is, a, it's a question of finding the balance. So any insights that you can share, Sagar, on how we would approach this question of balance? Because um, I, I don't want to go to the individual level just now, because you know that's actually quite simple. Uh, at one level that, you know, somebody's idea of a basic need is an air conditioner and another person's idea of a basic need may be a hand a, a waving fan. So, but let's stick with the structural issues that in a world where both commercial enterprise and entire nation's states are uh, kind of joint at the hip with the idea of indefinite growth. How, number one, can we define the limits of uh, violence to nature? Or no, sorry, let me rephrase that. Can we define balance without challenging that notion of growth, indefinite growth? Well, uh, it's already been challenged uh, and it is being challenged. I think uh, the voice is growing. Uh, the, for example, the first book on degrowth uh, came out uh, three years back, Degrowth in India. Okay. Uh, I uh, was, uh, I had the, you know, uh, fortune of being able to contribute a chapter to it uh, from a technical point of view. There were any other authors there who are very well-known economists and uh, sociologists and so on. Um, leave aside India. I mean, when you, uh, there was a very interesting question that an activist who's actually a, a teacher of political science asked me a, a few months back. He said, sure, degrowth, but where do we really stop? And I really had no answer, you know? Uh, so your question reflects what uh, this activist uh, actually intellectual activist asked me some time back. Um, I can only say this, that uh, in musings along with others who are thinking along these lines, um, I would say that, and my friends have helped me enormously in, in thinking along these lines. Uh, I would say that uh, we have to think along the lines of there is in nature always redundance. Mm. And every each species also has redundance. Uh, what is that band of energy that uh, the species is able to still so, you know, survive um, and flourish? It is within that band of energy that humans can tap that extra energy, which is beyond what they require for survival. Now, we will have to take in each region a keystone species and work it out. And I think we'll have to think something along these lines. 
Sagar, can you uh, explain now, that again? Can you, uh, I, that's a very important yeah. point you just made. So can you restate it maybe with some illustrations uh, uh, so that us yeah. non-technical people can grasp this? This redundancy wala is a very important point. Um, there's a very interesting migratory pattern that uh, you see between the Serengeti and the Masai Mara uh, in Africa. Serengeti is in Tanzania and Masai Mara is in Kenya. Now, sometime in March, the um, wild beast and the zebras cross over. They cross the Mara River uh, from uh, the Serengeti to the Masai Mara. And they're followed by the predators, by the hyenas. The hyenas and the lions don't cross the Mara River, but they chase them all the way there because it's around March that the grass gets over in Tanzania and they move over to uh, Sering uh, to Masai Mara, and sometime in October they move all the way back to Serengeti. So you have this perpetual chase. Now, if you didn't have predators, what would happen is that you would have basically the wild beast and the zebras, the two dominant species, you know, herbivores out there, growing in numbers, and that would finish off the grass uh, much more quickly. Now, obviously. Uh, what would happen then is that uh, there is a band of the amount of grass available uh, which controls or which influences the number of zebras that you can have in a sort of a unit area. Mm -hmm. um, if the grass goes below that uh, kind of level, then the number of zebras will decrease enormously. And if the grass, of course, increases uh, and there are no predators, the number of zebras again will increase. So there is a certain band within which the zebras thrive, okay? Now, if they're at somewhere at the upper end, you can get it down to somewhat like the lower end, but they will still thrive. Now, they are using energy uh, in order to survive and flourish, okay? So every species, in fact, uh, flourishes within a certain band of energy. Now, humans want much more than what they uh, require for survival. They want it. I mean, even if you make a stone tool, you're using extra energy. If you make a small wooden house, you're using extra energy. In fact, our energy growth, if you look at what energy, the energy we were using as a primitive uh, human um, has grown something like about, uh, I think, uh, 250 times. Uh, the difference between industrial humans and primitive humans, the energy growth is about 250 times. So we have stolen energy from other species. Now, the point is how much can we really take? Uh, that is the question without really injuring the other species. So if we say that stone species flourishes at somewhat closer to the lower end of the band of energy that they normally uh, operate within, then we have that energy in order to uh, you know, uh, use for our wants, not just needs, but our wants. We'll have to work these out. Uh, and uh, really, it, it is the work of uh, biologists uh, who are conversant with uh, energy computations who will have to do this kind of work. Not, not, not a mechanical or an environmental engineer like me. I'm, not, I'm too ignorant uh, to do these kind of computations. So in my uh, discussions with various other scientists and so on, this is one of the, we thought was one of the best ways of doing it, except that we didn't know how to do it someone else will have to do this. Probably mm. we will find such mm. people or mm. encourage younger biologists to do this kind of work. So I'm tempted to um, pose a rather dark thought here, which is not, I mean, it's not my thought. It's, it's in the air anyway. That then perhaps atomic weapons and all that we have done to accelerate climate change despite knowing that it is looming large now for 40 years, we've had that knowledge. Uh, maybe this is the design of nature to deal with the most destructive predatory species on the planet. If from what yeah, you're that's saying, that, that, that's, it's a very dark way of looking at it, but it has this, this has been suggested by some people. Yeah, I said that a while back. I mean, if you look at uh, the power uh, sort of uh, density, it's the highest for humans, uh, you know, if you go back to that previous slide. And whether 
nature has done it uh somehow or the other i i really don't have an answer because then it uh, there is a further question out there which is um the question of if if i know all the knowable information about the universe then are all processes deterministic or is there an element of chance so we are leading up to the question is there god or not i don't have an answer to that all i know from physics is that processes are not deterministic there is an element of chance and therefore all knowledge is not knowable no matter how fast a computer we have uh, right. or how much access to data we have that's right and therefore and and therefore whether nature has really created human beings as uh, a matter of chance or otherwise i don't have an answer i do know the uh, the, the question that jack monard a nobel laureate asked uh, he he basically stated uh, that well the 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 uh, uh, reaction of atoms to form molecules uh, is a necessity but the formation of the dna and uh, rna which is the basic you know building blocks for life itself was a matter of chance so he wrote this in a book called chance and necessity and uh, that was one of our god books when i was doing engineering uh, it was one of those books that really made you think mm. um so you are asking a very similar question right now as to whether human beings are nature's uh, solution uh, to you know what it has done right or wrong in in the creation of other species mm. maybe maybe no i don't know i don't have the answer i do know that some physicists have written papers on looking you know i, I don't understand all the uh, physics that they know or they they work on but they have come to conclusions like that there are there is an a uh, high element of uh, of of uh, randomness and therefore you cannot predict exactly which way uh things nature what force nature will take so i don't know whether humans were produced consciously or unconsciously by nature i tend to believe that it was unconscious so let's move to a simpler level of uh, relatively more knowable human volition uh now you were very much part of the anti atomic energy and anti atomic weapons movements and uh, that movement had some limited successes after all in a technical sense now nuclear weapons are deemed to be illegal so when we look at that movement and we look at the climate change movement both of which are uh, at their core issues of structural violence that we as a species are generating what is your reading today you're just back from cop 26 um in in practical and foreseeable terms uh, both on the nuclear weapons front and on the climate change front uh, what are now our chances of uh, you know any meaningful breakthroughs and by that i mean very simply are we likely to get to the end of this century with life as we know it or not no we won't wow that is for sure you're so sure absolutely explain see what people talk about what people talk about there are two throughputs in the economy the, you know if you look at what humans uh, do there are three sectors we take natural resources we then and these natural resources are basically energy and material resources uh, the much of the debate uh, that people uh, have been doing in in the climate change circles basically is about energy uh, there has not been enough discussion on the material throughput and that is the uh, 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 point which is actually probably going to be a bigger problem than climate change okay so we have material uh, throughputs and we have energy throughputs and we mix the two we use the two to create serve goods and services and that creates waste energy and it creates waste material which otherwise we call pollutants and we throw them out right okay so there are three sectors uh, where the the en- environment uh, from which we take resources which we, let me call it the source then we take these resources and produce goods and services let me call that the production sector and then we again go back to the environment and throw our wastes 
Now, for a long time, inequality was produced in the middle sector because uh, the surplus that was created was distributed uh, inequitably. The uh, crisis has developed now in the other two sectors, the environment from where we take resources, because water, uh, in fact, is going to be the first uh, resource where probably we will see water wars in the next couple of decades before we see energy wars. Uh, and at the other end, where we throw the resources, and Mother Earth is saying that it can't really, it doesn't have the capacity to take care of the resources, the wastes that we throw, both at the local and the you know, global level, uh, we are uh, you know, seeing crises. Now, if you look at the climate change uh, debate, essentially, it boils down to a very simple thing. Uh, the developed countries have used a lot of fossil fuels uh, in the last 300 years, and uh, they have basically developed themselves, created a certain living standard. So what are they saying, European Union and uh, the US and Australia? They're basically saying, listen, control the temperature. And they're telling particularly India and China that you need to get to net zero as quickly as possible. Okay. So they're basically saying, we want to protect our standard of living. What are the developing countries saying, particularly India and China? They're saying, listen, You've used a lot of fossil fuels and thrown them into the atmosphere and forming. Now we want to develop and you want to put a, you know, a strictures on our development. So we want to use coal because we have a lot of coal. So these two issues basically uh, are diametrically opposed to each other. These two issues are one is what is called net zero where we have to get to net zero carbon emission by 2050 if we want to remain within a 1.5 degree uh, temperature rise uh, by the end of the century. And the other is what is called climate justice. Now, much of the climate justice uh, protagonists, uh, mo most of them basically have talked about it in terms of unequal development or human rights and things of the sort. Like a quarter of Bangladesh more or less is going to drown, uh, is going to be under the sea quarter. by 2100. Quarter. <laughs> We've done the modeling for this. The whole of the Maldives is, will be under the sea. In fact, when I was a UNEP consultant... By uh, what, for, what year are we talking about, Sagar? These, these submersions? 2100. And it won't... I mean, it'll happen over successive decades. Yeah. The whole of the Sundarbans region and much of the... My own village, which is in the Krishna Delta, where I come from, will be under, under the sea by 2100. You will have eight, something like between five and eight crore uh, Bangladeshi climate refugees. Climate refugee means that there is no home to go back to. You'll have, as of now, five lakh uh, Maldivian refugees, no home to go back to. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, so the main point uh, I'm, I'm trying. So what the developing countries are saying is, give us uh, the opportunity to develop even if uh, they are given what is called all the remaining carbon space. The remaining carbon space is at current uh, emission levels. We have only another 10 to 12 years uh, of carbon space to put out that much uh, of carbon emission and still remain within 1.5. Actually, we've already crossed 1.5. If you remove the aerosols, if you clean up the air in Bombay and Hyderabad and and so on and so forth, because aerosols have a cooling effect of 0.3 to 0.4 degrees. So if you clean Bombay's air and Delhi's air, you will be at 1.5 today. We are already at a measured 1.1. You'll be at 1.5 if you clean out uh, the aerosols. That is the sul sulfur dioxide, the nitrogen dioxide, and the other aerosols. Okay. So basically, the, the point is that the, the uh, issue of uh, net zero and the issue of climate justice are diametrically uh, opposed to each other. While India talks of climate justice vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries, it says, give us the opportunity to develop. Okay, but is it offering the same uh, uh, for its own citizens? No, because if energy is expended in India, then it is the rich who are going to develop and the poor are going to remain more or less where they are because trickle-down theory has failed and everybody says that, okay? Right from Stiglitz to X, Y, Z, say all these things, fine. So the point I'm trying to make is, what is the condition under which uh, you can get out of a lose-lose situation? Because right now we are 
at, at with what we are trying to do at this moment of time with what the cop 26 has come out as agreements which are very very weak the predictions are that we will be at a temperature of between 3 to 4 degrees uh, by 2100 now um a part of bombay in fact is going to be under the sea by 2100 uh, particularly the bandra kurla uh, area and so on which is i believe being developed as the new cbd area again we model these things and we see these in the models you know model results and things of the sort so the only condition uh, that i could think of and i put this to a bunch of seven uh, british members of parliament including an additional member of parliament from ireland and from italy and brazil and so on is if each one of us can hold two passports not a single passport we can continue to hold have our culture as for example a mumbai kar tumhi mumbai kar ahe mi mumbai kar ahe ha bara tumhi changla hai ka mi changla hai all that you know continue to have our food uh, our songs our local culture continue to hold an indian passport but at the same time have an international passport because right now as long as we are divided within nation states you cannot solve these irreconcilable issues of uh, climate justice on the one hand and uh, on the other hand net, uh, trying to get to net zero by 2050 or 2035 so my solution my redefinition of what is climate justice is that some countries have created wealth out of burning fossil fuels but they have also created risks not really so much for themselves but really for the developing countries the most vulnerable regions in the world to global warming are the sahel region of africa and south asia these are the two most vulnerable regions okay is share the wealth equitably and share the risks equitably and you can do that only when you think not just as an indian but when you think as a global person there's a very interesting conversation i had at cop 26 Uh, which i would like to narrate which is i met the uh, minister of environment of bangladesh and she put she asked me to talk to her advisor on issues and i put the question to him and th- i wrote this in an article it's already uh, published uh, and uh, this advisor i i put the question to him i said what are you do you have a solution to the problem that about 20 to 25% of bangladesh will be under the sea by 2100 he says we are aware of it we have no solution that evening while i was going back to where i was staying i met some bangladeshi uh, cop 26 participants and i said uh, i put the same question to them and they said yes one of them said i have an answer i said what is your answer he said india should take them and that's exactly what i wrote in the article that on humanitarian grounds india should take before other countries take those those i have been to those parts of bangladesh to kulna uh they are much poorer than the indians on uh, of uh, who are on the indian side of the sundarbans mangrove forest it is india's duty to take them similarly pakistan is going to have a huge problem uh, it has only one river the indus the indus river is dependent to the extent of 60% on uh, glacial melt and snow melt none of the indian rivers that come from the himalayas <clears throat> are dependent to that extent they dependent only to the extent of 10 to 20% the ganga and the brahmaputra what is going to happen after to the glaciers melt pakistan is going to be in dire straits and this is something that's already been predicted and this is something that the government knows in fact when I, again when i was a unep consultant and was in islamabad many years back their ministry of environment people told me this that we are going to be in dire straits and due course of time and this time around again i interviewed in cop 26 a pakistani uh, scientist uh, who was uh, part of their team government team and i asked him do you have a solution for this problem he said no we don't have a solution for this problem and so uh, india is going to have a lot of problems in fact men much more than what uh, pakistan or bangladesh is going to have and it will require help uh, from other countries the only way we can survive and get out uh, of this whole problem is if we also have an international passport if we think not just as indians but also as global citizens 
So Sagar, a lot of young people are keen to be part of the solution. Okay, and I think a significant number that I meet, this is not a statistical claim, are seeing the absurdity of thinking that if you don't print the receipt at the ATM, you're making helping to make a difference. What advice would you give to them? Those who want to both be make meaningful choices in their own life, but who want to somehow counter the global structural injustice that has brought us to this impasse. How, how would you suggest this? They, they, you know, they commit their energy. What, okay, what, I, can, I mean, they, they want to work for a non-violent economics. How can they do it? What, what would that mean? In closing. Uh, there, are, there are two very broad parts that we have. Long term, you know, the path is in a sense hazy which way it will go, one doesn't know. But there are two very broad objectives. One is we will have to power down. We will have to reduce our energy consumption. Solar and wind energy are not a substitute for uh, fossil fuels. They cannot replace fossil fuels. Nuclear energy, leave aside its uh, hazardous nature and things of that sort, there is not enough nuclear ore to, uh, to fuel the current reactors for more than another 150 years. You don't have uranium ore, so it's going to go out. Uh, fast breeder reactors have not worked, and fusion technology is still a dream at this point of time. Okay, Again, I won't get into the technical details of all this, so you have to power down. Some scientists, in fact, have, have written saying that we have to power down and, and published in the, their papers in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, saying that we have to power down by 90%. Now, my own computation is about 50%. Okay? The other, uh, you know, uh, thing is that both inequality and basically um, uh, our fight against anthropocentrism, they're flip sides of the same point. So we have to become a society which is equitable because it is inequality and anthropocentrism or rather private ownership of nature and anthropocentrism that has led to growth. So we'll have to get into uh, a situation of you know being steady state. But how do you fight these two? Because both these uh, 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 ideologies and the institutions that they've spawned out are more or less 5,000 years old. They're not going to go away just because you wish them away. They're going to fight back. And they're far more powerful than uh, anybody who talks about, let's you know, be biocentric or let's be a, a, a more kind of an equal society and so on and so forth. So it's going to be a long drawn thing. But well before that, my fear is that we are going to run out of uh, energy and we're going to run out of a lot of non-renewable uh, uh, ores. 80 non-renewable ores are going to, uh, peak out and start exhausting out within the next 50 to 70 years. In fact, the, 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 the question is, if people think that solar is a solution, there is a simple question to put for which uh, they need to answer. Yeah, are you going to have any copper after another 50 or 60 years? How are you going to connect your PV panel to the grid without copper? So even if you are able to make a PV panel, you can't connect it to the grid because you don't have a conductor. So what we've done is we've just overused a lot of uh, material, uh, material non-renewable resources. And in doing so, um, what we've done is we've uh, hacked our own, axed our own feet, so to speak. So we have actually what I believe is three problems. One is, you know, three tipping points today. One is what goes by the name peak oil, but what it does is it represents, in fact, the exhaustion the peaking and the exhaustion of a lot of non-renewable ores and materials, 80 to be, you know, more or less uh, uh, talking. If, if I talk in numbers, it's about 80 right now. And that includes major ores like iron ore and uh, bauxite and things of this sort. Uh, this is one tipping point. And mind you, uh, in the past, Civilizations have collapsed because they ran out of energy. The Mayan civilization collapsed that way. The Indus Valley civilization collapsed that way. Uh, the Polynesians collapsed that way, and so on. Uh, this is a problem that a lot of people uh, are either unaware of, or even if they're 
easily aware of they don't talk enough about it and some of us have found that in fact when we write articles on peak oil uh, there are leading journals which are and newspapers which are unwilling to publish they are willing to publish things on climate change but not on peak oil the other tipping point is peak oil okay the third is really galloping inequality sorry and, what was the second uh, what was the second climate change ah or plan the climate crisis about which so much has been spoken about i don't really have to talk about it. right right and the third is galloping inequality these are the three tipping points we face today it's a challenge and what i have to tell uh, younger people is i am the cause of it my generation is the cause of it the system which we accepted is the cause of it and if you want to rectify it there are two very broad things that have to be done uh, one is you have to power down and we have to move towards an equal society that means we have to give up private ownership and move towards what other species do uh use of fruct rights no ownership rights okay and this includes for the state because i believe that russia and china or soviet union and china uh as a state they had they owned private property and that should not be allowed if you want an equal society okay now having said that at the local level do anything that will take you more or less in this direction i am not going to specify don't uh, take a piece of paper from the atm after all using the atm itself is quite you know since we have been into very small things on uh, you know we we've done five very large energy and uh, uh, carbon calculators which we do a lot of workshops my interns and students do a lot of workshops in universities on these things the internet itself is quite energy intensive so if you believe that by using the internet you are saving energy no that's not correct so we have to learn but individual action while it is a good thing to do is not going to solve the problem because the problem is systemic some total of individual solutions is not equal to a social solution but individual action is as important as a social solution because it's only by doing individual action that you are able to inspire the next guy and unless you get all the people of the world together more or less on one page you're not going to be able to solve this problem and this is one of the other points i made to those british mps which is i said epochal changes are not made by governments they're made by you know, by people and so what is the relevance of cop 26 of course governments can make you know incremental small changes but they cannot make epochal changes and what we are faced with today is the biggest epochal change human society has, has ever faced which is trying to dumb down anthropocentrism and private ownership of nature it's the biggest epochal change that you know we are looking at and much smaller epochal changes for example the fight against colonialism have never been done by governments they have always been done by people and this epochal change also has to be done by people the big problem is how do we get all the people of the world more or less onto one page that's a huge ask if we don't do that and uh, the 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 belief that many of us have uh, is there are only two roads either we get to our senses and take the right road or the other road is going to take human society to absolute let's say devastation thank you sagar thank What you very much call.